I know I've been hard on Peter over the past few weeks, painting a picture of him over the last few sermons as a kind of Don Quixote-like figure in the annals of Christianity, the guy who always seems to get it wrong, though at the same time ends up being a pillar, an exemplar, and has earned a name of the highest esteem. I mean, St. Peter Lutheran Church is the name of some Lutheran churches. Not bad for the guy of little faith, who began to sink during the storm, who was yelled at by Jesus in our gospel reading today, and then goes on to deny Jesus three times before fleeing. But we've covered all of that in the past weeks. We've covered Peter's ability to get things almost miraculously wrong, and in doing so, gives us a window to see ourselves in the gospel. To see ourselves, those of us who also get things wrong. Those of us who say the wrong things sometimes. Those of us who feel like we are sinking from time to time, even though we can see and know that Jesus is there. Those of us who mean well, even though our best of intentions do not play out the way we thought they would. It's like the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, which is kind of fitting this week as Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Maybe there's some connection there somewhere. But Peter does mean well. He's worried about his friend and his Messiah. He's worried about Jesus. Jesus has just been talking about how he has to undergo much suffering, be killed, and on the third day be raised. Who wouldn't be worried or try to stop a friend who was walking around talking about going into a situation of great suffering and then death? Let's be honest, the fear of a friend suffering and being put to death makes the last phrase about being raised a lot harder to hear harder to get to. Also, remember that we read scriptures already knowing the ending. At this time, as Matthew has written his gospel, Peter has not seen or known anyone who has been raised from the dead. Now, Matthew's gospel is his account of the life and ministry of Jesus, with Jesus. Is it literally Matthew's daily diary? I don't think so solely based on the reality of finding writing utensils and papyrus or parchment there in the first century. Like, that would be quite the task. It seems a lot more likely to me that each gospel was compiled and written after the ascension of our Lord so that these accounts of ministry could simply be recorded and then shared with the early church. So consider this. Matthew, from after the ascension, is writing how he remembers these events involving Peter that happened prior to Holy Week, and we are reading them some 2,000 years later. It's kind of fun to think about how we shift time like that, if only for a moment. Now, you might be wondering what all this has to do with each other. What does Peter and his apparent misstep have to do with Matthew writing in the future and us hearing this account far beyond any future that the disciples could have imagined? But consider this. In the last verse of our gospel reading today, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming again. Now, that might sound odd, like the foretelling of something that didn't happen, as we wait for the return of Jesus, long after the deaths of Peter and the other disciples. And that notion has undoubtedly been exacerbated a few, if not more than a few years ago, with the phenomenal sales of the Left Behind series. A book series, which, let me underline this, is fiction though does deal with the topic of the rapture or the second coming, though albeit fiction. Now, hear me out. Christ came into the world as a babe in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes as angels appeared in a field to sing glory to God in the highest to the shepherds, alerting them to the miracle of the word made flesh in Mary's arms found at a stable in Bethlehem. 
That is how Christ came into the world. In today's reading, Jesus describes how he has to undergo much suffering, be killed, and on the third day be raised. That's the plan. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for the salvation of the cosmos depends on Jesus' life and death and resurrection. That is to say, his return. Jesus will die. Suffer death and be buried, as we remember in the words of the Athanasian Creed. Descend into the dead, as we remember in the words of the Apostles' Creed. He will go away, and then he will return. And he will, on the third day, be raised. Just like he says to Peter. It's all part of Jesus' plan. Now, despite his best intentions... Peter's desire to protect his friend would, in fact, keep Jesus' plan from happening. If the suffering and the death never happens, like Peter hopes, then we never get to the resurrection. This understanding is where Jesus is speaking from when he replies, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter's fault here is that he cannot see Jesus' ultimate trajectory. Peter is stopped by the fear of his friend's suffering and death, and because of that, Peter cannot hear, fathom, or register what it might mean for Jesus to be raised three days later. In that moment, Peter becomes an antagonist to the trajectory of Jesus Christ, a stumbling block to him, an obstacle to Jesus' mission, an unknowing opponent to the power of what God is doing in Jesus, who is the Christ. Get behind me, adversary, Jesus says. You are a stumbling block. Peter means well. He's coming from a good place. Though what Jesus says is true, Peter has set his mind not on divine things, like the work of Jesus' holy task, but on human things. Now, some might read this very verse and think that it glorifies suffering, or that it glorifies a lack of self-care. You know, the idea of don't worry about yourself, only worry about Jesus and the church. That, however, is taking a specific line from a certain conversation and misrepresenting it out of context as some kind of uh, assumed universal truth. Jesus is not giving us a blanket statement in regards to our individual lives. He is speaking directly to Peter, who is once again getting things wrong, although he means well. What we know from 2023 as we read this account is that everything that Jesus says will happen, happens. The suffering and the death, and then Jesus is raised three days later and appears in a house with locked doors for fear of the crowds outside. After the palms are laid down, after Peter denies, after the cock crows, after the scarlet robe and the crown of thorns are put on Jesus and then taken off of him, Jesus is raised three days later. And there, in that room, with the locked doors, Peter sees the Son of Man come in his kingdom. Peter sees Jesus return and stands there in the midst of those like himself that will be used to build the kingdom of God here in this place. People just like himself, the good and the bad, people like you and I. Those who do maybe not as they ought, but surely as they are able, knowing that God will carry and support them. Friends, it is this group that we join with Peter in the church across time and space, celebrating that Christ has come, that Christ has returned, and that Christ will return again. And it is for that return we patiently and joyfully wait. Thanks be to God. Amen.